Hello, this is the backup video for European History on Thursday, September 24th, 2020. Starting this a little early, so there's probably going to be some dead time and you'll get to hear announcements before we actually begin. Yeah, that should do. You know what? I'm not going to start it now. Oh, why not? Okay, you'll get to hear announcements. Good morning, Court Lane Charter Academy. This is Ethan Renault, your ASB Vice President, here with your morning announcement. Sports announcement. Congratulations to the Charter Boys Soccer and their 2 0 win over Timberlake last night. Both the boys and the girls team will play against the Priest River on Saturday out of the field at Real Life. Both games will start at 2 p.m. High School Cross Country will run the Ivan Benson Invitational today after school up at Priest River High School. Lady Panthers Volleyball will travel up to Bonners Ferry to play the Lady Badgers tonight at 6 p.m. Congrats to the Middle School Volleyball A team and their win over Genesis Prep yesterday. Both the A and B teams will play Genesis Prep again next on campus at the middle school and PR. Don't miss the Washington, D.C. trip informational meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the high school and PR. All 8th grade and high school students are invited. Tomorrow is the last day to put in your order for the first round of charter school sweatshirts. Sweatshirts start at $25 and can be personalized for an additional $5. Orders can be placed at the high school office or through the online store. The ASB Club Fair will be next Monday and Tuesday after school out on the field. Come out and see what extracurricular activities are being offered this year. Don't miss out on this year's yearbook. The Cornland Charter 2020-2021 through 2021 yearbook is on sale right now for $35, the lowest price of the year. You can add your name to your yearbook for an additional $5, but only during the first quarter. Order your yearbook at the high school office or through the online store. Now, thank you for listening. Our quote of the day comes from Michael Scott. Well, 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 how the turntables. Now, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United I States of America and to the Republic the for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In the Middle Ages, Western civilization has something that no other civilization has. A structure that's as powerful as any government, in some ways more powerful than any government, that's not under the direct control of the government. We're talking about the Christian church in the West, the Western Christian church what will morph into during the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church. In China, the emperor has a religious role as well as a political role. He is the son of heaven. And the Chinese emperor's job is to surf the ever-changing balance of elemental forces in order to orient Zheng Guo, the Middle Kingdom, to harmonious relationship with the powers that are the universe. So this is a religious as well as a political function. In India, uh, the caste system of the Hindus says that Shachira uh, and Brahman uh, are appointed by the clarinet, the cleansliness the cleansliness, the cleansedness, and the clarity of their souls. That in the great chain of being, one soul either goes up or downs the, down the chain, and in doing so, you are born into a lower or a higher caste. The highest caste is the Brahmin prince. Somebody who is born with such a clean soul from living so many good lives that they have been given power and rulership. But you see, 
the religious as well as the political roles blended. In Islam, there is the caliph who has a religious as well as a political function. And even the sultan, which later comes, which is a much more military and political office, still has some religious significance. In ancient Egypt, of course, you know about the uh, god kings. And in Japan, to this day, their emperor is a god emperor, directly descended from Amaterasu Omikami, goddess of the sun. So in all of these civilizations, and I could go on to mention the American civilizations in Middle America, up to and including the Aztecs and the Inca. The Inca's king is the sun's representative on earth, sun as in big shining ball in the sky. And the Aztec rulership was a combination of religious and political because one of the main jobs of the government was to provide massive numbers of human sacrifices to keep time itself flowing. Even in Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzant the Byzantine Empire, the emperor is considered to be God's chief human, and the patriarchs and leaders of the church play a subordinate role to him just as the political leadership does. Only in Western Europe do you have, and uh, for those of you at home, I hope you've checked in, an independent, a truly independent church structure. This is key to the development of freedom because with an independent church, there is going to be the intent that they work together in harmony with God's plan to care for and lead God's people. However, people being people, they got to know who's bestest ever. And at their point of contact, you have at least as much contact or, or conflict as cooperation. Though intended to be cooperative, the institutions of church and state in feudalism often conflict. So how does this benefit the development of concepts of individual freedom? Well, if you have a family with two parents, and if you have a child that is not a perfect little angel, and those parents have different attitudes, for example, on indulging a child's whims, you might ask that child, be pretty purposeful about which parent you ask for what benefit. Because one parent is going to be more stern and stoical and say, nah, you don't need it, up, need it, toughen up, buttercup. The other one might say, oh, sure, you've been working hard. You deserve it. So most children who are in two-parent households quickly learn which parent is a soft touch on which issue. Also, given that into each life a little rain must fall, even the best marriages have arguments. In fact, sometimes the best marriages have arguments that are not uncommon because that prevents pressure and tension from building up. And one of the nastier sides of nuclear family dynamics is that, despite the fact that no sane parent would want to involve their children in a fight with their spouse, the kids get involved, at least peripherally, uh, sometimes more so. And when parents really lose their perspective, they can actually descend into the rather sad state of trying to compete for their children's affections. In a selfish, non-healthy, schadenfreude way, the children can benefit from this by playing one parent off against the other, by appreciating that in the conflicts that may develop, <clears throat> the children might have a chance to 
be catered to by one side or the other. Again, it's not healthy, it's not great, but it happens. In Europe, who gets the benefit from those times when church and state conflict with one another? The people of Europe. Not only the nobles, <clears throat> not only the priests and monks and nuns, but the laity or the common people, the townsmen and tradesmen that come below the warriors and above the peasant serfs and slaves, and even the peasant serfs and slaves sometimes. Because in their conflict with one another, sometimes the kings and sometimes the popes will actually offer goodies to people for their loyalty. Also, and this is the especial truth, because there is no singular and unitary ruler that combines both religious and political power, you can get away from the dictates of one by sheltering under the skirts of the other. You can, in fact, use the church to protect you from an overweening state power, and you can use the kings to protect you in those times when the church's rule becomes onerous. This dynamic of a balance of power between church and state is important because it grants people an alternative to a singular unitary monolithic government. This is the great problem with the willful or accidental misinterpretation of the notion that our founders intended to have a separation of church and state. Oh, there was a time when our founders wanted to establish a Church of the United States analogous to the Church of England and to give the leadership of that church to George Washington. And not, uh, very few of our founders, I won't say not because you never know, but very few of our founders would have accepted or wanted a society that was so separation of church and statey that they became officially atheistic. That's just something we are lurching towards if not actually going to have happen. Because our founders, being revolutionaries, being people who decided that their government was in fact tyrannical and needed to be changed by force, damned traitors to their king, understood how necessary it was to have religion be a powerful enough force in society that it could help the revolutionaries in their struggle against a tyrannical king. As many local American churches of many denominations did support the revolution. If you eliminate the power of church, if you eliminate the influence of religious institutions, we are left at the mercy of the power of the state with no recourse. But if there is a strong religious element in society and strong religious institutions in society, there is an appeal that you can make to something that's beyond government and above government in some respects that could in fact limit the power and damage that a bad government or a well or a badly intentioning government could could do. This is one of the things that disturbs me about the notion of closing down religious services in the name of plague control. That's something that's never really been done. Certainly not in the United States. The notion that the government actually has the power to close churches and enforce such closure is something that our founders would have found very disturbing and very surprising. However, most Americans in the face of a pandemic crisis are willing to temporarily at least give the government the benefit of the doubt, which is what had happened in March and afterwards. But as time goes on, more and more Americans, even if they are not personally religious, seem to have problems with the notion of the government saying, no, no, you can't have church services except tiny ones, except outdoors, yada, yada. I'm going to close these windows a little bit so that you're not chilled beyond a reasonable point. And I'll leave this one open partially 
If it's cold, feel free to move. So, the balance of power between church and state is key in the development of independent institutions beyond those of church and state, and in the development, ultimately, of individual rights. And that balance of power has been a critical element of the uh, American Republic from its inception. The great French uh, reporter, Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to the United States in the 1820s as an admirer of American freedom, and as somebody who wanted to advocate such freedom to return to France, or to appear in France, depending upon your opinion of the French Revolution. One of the, the, the line of de Tocqueville that sticks with me the, the most is here we have a republic in the United States where people are routinely so deep into the frontier that they may not see a lawman, let alone a courthouse, for years at a time. And yet most of them, most of the time, do the lawful and right thing. Whereas in Europe, that wouldn't necessarily happen. Again, witness the French Revolution, which we'll talk about later. Why is this, de Tocqueville wondered? And his answer was the solid religious faith of most Americans, which caused them to control themselves, not out of fear of the government's lash, but out of fear or love of the Lord. Because they were religious, they self-regulated. And here's a secret to freedom as a child, in a workplace, and in a society under the government. The more everyone knows that you are personally capable of regulating your own actions without somebody looking over your shoulder sternly, making sure you don't do wrong and that you do do right, the more you demonstrate capability to do that, the less people are going to regulate you. Because frankly, they've got other things to do. If you demonstrate that you're worthy of trust, people might trust you with more scope, more freedom, more responsibility. As teenagers, this is kind of important information that you might want to have. If you're constantly playing the rebel and are doing stupid, irresponsible, reckless things, your parents are going to feel the need to clamp down on you for your own safety until you survive this period of madness. But if you are yourselves responsible, trustworthy, even a little wise, not wise as in wise acre, but wise as in genuine wisdom, they, they will probably trust you more with more freedom because you're worthy of it. So this all plays out. Now, there is a peak time of, uh, in, the, in the fight between church and state between the popes, and especially the Holy Roman Emperors, between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, as, as German history calls it. Guelphs are Pope supporters, Ghibellines are Emperor supporters. Again and again, emperors in the Middle Ages lament the fact that Charlemagne had himself coronated by the Pope, thus implying that the popes were equal or even the dispensers of such a coronation. Napoleon actually takes this up in 1805, uh, three, four, five, I forget. I think it's 04, I could be wrong. Laugh at me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, when he crowns himself while the Pope sits as a prisoner, mutely watching, because nobody is worthy of crowning Napoleon French Emperor other than Napoleon himself who made it happen. He didn't have a vanity problem, not at all. So, there comes a moment of peak papal power. The Holy Roman Emperor is in conflict with the Pope, and the Pope, Innocent III, excommunicates the Holy Roman Emperor. You are no longer within the body of the church. You are no longer capable of receiving sacraments. That means absolution. That means that none of your people, thanks to feudalism, are also capable of of receiving sacraments, that includes last rites, that includes uh, baptism. So throughout Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and uh, the Central European region, which is the Holy Roman Empire, huge numbers of people 
can't get necessary services. Because if you're a Christian believer and you can't get your baby baptized, that your baby's soul is at risk, the belief is. More prone to demonic possession, more prone to evil, unless they're baptized, consecrated to the Lord. What about a person who's dying? They can't get extreme unction, the anointing of the sick. They can't get last rites. Their graves cannot be sanctified, ground. While this lasts, this papal ban, because the emperor is being so resistant to the pope's religious authority, Pope argues, uh, the people of the Holy Roman Empire actually begin resisting uh, their own government. Not that the emperor himself has that much power, but everyone in Germany is feeling the pinch. And so the emperor is compelled to go to the pope, who is spending time in winter in an alpine tower at a place called Canossa. At Canossa, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry, I believe his name was, rides up in a snowstorm in the mountains with his retinue. He dismounts. He does not go to the gate. He immediately drops to his knees in armor and starts apologizing. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It's my fault, it's my fault. I am totally at fault. And for hours in the snow, as the snow piles up around his thighs and midriff, the Pope listens to the Emperor humbling himself in the snow, sitting in a tower by a fire, drinking mulled wine. Canossa is the absolute apex of papal, the, the Pope's winning over the Emperor's. The emperor is humbling himself. Eventually, the pope, of course, comes down, accepts his apology. They embrace, and the emperor is uh, back in the church. His excommunication is canceled. The ban is finished, and all those children get baptized, and all those graves get sanctified, and life goes on. The pope's argument was, we have, we, the royal we, we, the popes, have a universal authority in nomine Deus, in the name of God, in nomine Christos, in the name of Christ, to care for the spiritual well-being of God's people everywhere. And as such, the, per the church needs to be a strong, independent institution above politics. In fact, since the kings of Europe receive their crowns through a coronation ceremony officiated up by church officials, that is a recognition that the church is the dispenser of political power in God's name. And if the church refused to coronate someone, they're not going to be king, at least insofar as the church is concerned. So Innocent and other active popes of this period, Innocent III and other active popes, insist that the church is above the state, that the state are regional governors, within Christendom, a Christendom officiated over by the Roman Catholic Church, by its Pope, by its cardinals, its archbishops, its bishops, in the name of God. And there is some tendency that's still like this today. Where do you think the European Union idea comes from? It's the same notion that even though we're different nations, we're one people. And the nation's power should be reduced and the unitary power of us being one people should be increased. The United Nations organization, as corrupt as it is, has that same ideal at its heart, as did the moribund and ineffective League of Nations before it. The notion that all mankind, that all the people of the world are together on this planet as human beings, and that there should be some kind of pan-national organization that speaks for all humanity separate from and above the national governments and their various squabbling interests. The church aspires to this. So that's the church's argument, and Canossa is their ultimate moment of power. However, it doesn't last. 
A bit later, the French kings watch a squabble over who's going to become the next pope. The French kings officiate over a very Catholic land, and the French monarchy is closely entwined with the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, to the extent the French have a medieval legislature that comes together, there are three estates in it. The third estate are common people, untitled. The second estate are the nobility, the marquises and dukes and so forth. The first estate is the Roman Catholic clergy. So the Roman Catholic clergy in France controls one-third of the French legislature in the Middle Ages and into modern times. That's how powerful the church is. So the French king says, why should a weaselly little Italian bishop be the leader of Christ's people when Christ's people have expanded while the world has changed so much? So in the midst of a succession crisis, instead of accepting the candidate that has arrived at in conclave or trying to corrupt the process, the French kings basically send for the Pope. Their armies bring the Pope to Avignon. Avignon is a southern French city. It is a beautiful little, it's not even really a city, it's a town. It's a town. It's a, it's a beautiful French town in the south of France. And for 70 or 80 years, the French assert that the Pope in Avignon is the Pope, capital T, capital P, the Pope. At first, the rest of Christendom is shocked, huh? And at first, they go along with it. But after a while, other monarchs begin to say, hey, why does the French king get its own little Pope? Because the Pope of the French king is really a Pope. Hello, Pope, Pope. Because obviously he's a puppet of the French king. The Avignon popes will not do anything that violates French national interests. So suddenly, there are other popes that, pope, that pop up over Europe. <laughs> I'm a history teacher. I get to say terrible jokes and not have things thrown at me, like rotten fruit or chairs. Well, most of the time. It has happened. Suddenly, there are two popes. Then there are four popes. At one point, there are eight popes in Europe simultaneously. And all of those eight popes call all of the seven others anti-pope and anti-Christ. Now, anti-pope is pretty bad. But calling somebody anti-Christ? Anti-Christ in the book of the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelations, is the son of Satan who is to bring darkness to the world in the end times. Antichrist does the opposite of what Christ does. If Christ brings people into a good relationship with a loving God, Antichrist destroys all of that. In the book of Revelations, Antichrist is described as Nero reborn. And Nero, remember, was the first Roman emperor that went purposefully after the Christians and invented whole new types of torture for them. So calling somebody anti-Christ in a Christian society, big deal. And of course, all of these popes had royals behind them, and they had armies, and they were fighting. This is called the schism, the great schism, or the papal schism. And the popes are struggling with one another all over Europe. Finally, <laughs> people realize on all sides, this has gone too far. This is destroying not just the church, it's damaging the state, it's damaging society, it's bad for everyone. And it's got to stop. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a church council. And in that church council, <coughs> which is not the Albigensian crusade. We'll talk about that in a moment. In that church council, all the other popes are going to be defrocked. They're no longer going to be popes. They may still be bishops or priests, but they're no longer going to be popes. And a new conclave will be held, and a new pope will be elected, and that pope will be in Rome, and that's it. All this is going to stop. And it works. It actually works. 
except some of the popes after this have to deal with what's called the conciliar movement, which is a movement that says the church councils can outvote popes, and the popes don't like that. But that doesn't last either. Now, there's another religious thing that you need to understand. And it happens in the shadow of all of these events, the Little Ice Age, the harsherness of life, the spread of disease, uh, the divisions within the church. In the south of France, not Avignon, a group of people, priests, nobles, begin to question some pretty basic stuff. And they decide that they are going to purify the church, the state, the society, and invent something truly new and truly righteous. They call themselves the Cathari, the purified ones, or the purifying ones, depending upon how you interpret it. And they launch what's called, uh, well, they launch a movement that has noblemen giving up their titles and giving up their castles, priests giving up their vows, husbands and wives giving up their vows, and everyone's going to live and love and raise children in common. This is sort of a medieval Christian version of absolute communism. Instead of having families raise their children, children are raised by the community. Everyone gathers and eats a common meal produced by people who all work in a common kitchen. There are no more rich. There is no more poor. Everyone shares everything. Everyone takes part in worship and in leading worship. No more popes, no more priests, no more nobles, no more kings, no more of those old laws. Now, what happens when the crowd arrives and invites the nobles of other castles nearby to join in this happy kumbaya experience? Well, if the noble says yes, they give up their castle and their property and everything's hunky-dory. The nobles become like everyone else. But if not, well, they get burned out and killed. Um, this spreads throughout southern France. And it is antithetical to Western civilization, at least insofar as the priests and uh, the kings are concerned. So the Pope launches what is called the Albigensian Crusade. You may want to write this down. Albi is A-L-B-I, Genzian is G-E-N-S-I-A-N, -E the Albi Genzian Crusade. Albi Genzian Crusade. At first, the southern area of France affected is cordoned off and quarantined like they have a communicable mental illness. Knights gather from all over Europe and priests gather from all over Europe to contain this and make sure it hasn't spread beyond the quarantine zone. One of the people in one of these armies is a man who will later become St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominican Order. Uh, and after the quarantine is assured, the armies begin closing in on the Albigensians from all sides, on the Cathari from all sides. In this war, there's no mercy. There's no treaties. There's no quarter. The people who rule Europe and the people of Europe who are supportive of traditional civilization want this whole thing wiped out. And so entire villages are depopulated. The Albigensians, the Cathari, they don't fight uh, fair either. They use every method that they can to try to destroy the invading armies. Ultimately, there is a bloodbath that echoes through the next few hundred years. Oh, we don't want to have an Albigensian crusade again. We don't want to provoke it, and we don't want to have one. And St. Dominic comes to the conclusion after this that uh, the problem was that the church failed in its teaching mission. That people who were supposedly church leaders or educated nobility could actually think that Christ wanted a society where there was no family, where there was no property, where there was no government, where there was no church, uh, where everything was shared and nothing was private. And uh, that because of that, Dominic establishes what's known as the Order of Preachers, the Dominican Order. And the Order of Preachers, the black and white robed um, Dominicans, become the great teachers of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas, 
who is the great philosopher of the late Middle Ages, frankly, of the whole Middle Ages, uh, is a Dominican who uh, works at the University of Paris. So one of the things that the Dominicans do is they teach. But what about those people who refuse to learn? Well, the Holy Inquisition is established. The Holy Inquisition at first in Rome and later elsewhere. And the Inquisition is a court. At first, it's designed as a teaching institution. If, for example, Mr. Knife was teaching heretical teachings, the Inquisition would bring you in and it try to explain to you where you went wrong in terms of your understanding of theology. If you accepted that you were wrong and that you uh, recanted and said, I'm sorry, I was wrong, don't listen to what I said, that's what recant means. Recant, R-E-C-A-N-T. I'm sorry, I was wrong, don't listen to what I said. If you recanted, everything would be fine. If, however, you persisted stubbornly in your heretical beliefs, uh, you'd be uh, re-educated, punished, isolated, depending upon the circumstance. Not that you'd ever say anything like that. In the Inquisition, though, soon a new spirit takes over, and it's not about teaching. It's about rooting out thought crime and punishing it. And we're going to talk more about the Inquisition when we talk about the Catholic Protestant controversy. So, that deals with conflicts between church and state. Now, one of the things that the Little Ice Age unleashes is the Mongol conquests. The Mongols were a pagan people of Central Asia, uh, one of many tribes who lived there. And under Temujin, or Genghis Khan, he takes on the mission of unifying the eight corners of the world under one yurt, under one roof. And the Mongols take over China and India and the eastern third of the Islamic world of Russia. And they even invade Eastern Europe and get as far as Hungary at the Battle of the Seijo River. The Mongols don't lose wars, not to other people. The Mongols, wherever they go, they conquer, sooner or later. They are fierce. I could tell you stories, but I'll simply say this. The Mongols do not believe in civilization. They think civilization is destructive of natural human traits. Genghis Khan told his soldiers after conquering China, don't start living in those cities, they're too luxurious. Before you know it, you'll be thinking like a Chinese person rather than like a Mongol, like prey rather than like a predator. And his grandson, Kublai Khan, lived like a Chinese emperor in a pleasure dome. And the Mongols did lose their edge. And eventually they were absorbed, the ones who conquered, into Chinese society. That's the great genius of China. When they are conquered by barbarians, they don't have a dark age. They absorb the barbarians into their higher culture. This works until they encountered the West in the 1800s. The Mongols are going to have an influence on Western history. First off, early Mongol attacks made the Crusades possible because they distracted the Islamic world with a much greater threat than a bunch of European knights. The Mongols also are going to control Russia for over 200 years. And Russia is an anomaly as far as Western civilization is concerned. On the one hand, Russia is absolutely European. On the other hand, Russia is absolutely Asiatic. On the one hand, there are Russian tendencies with their Eastern Orthodox Church towards being part of Christendom, or at least associated with it, on the other hand, the Mongol influence says that power is about wielding force with cruelty to induce terror and obedience. So Russians re respect raw power. Ivan Grosny, Ivan the Terrible, the first uh, Romanov uh, to really make an impact in history, is still respected deeply in Russian history, even though he earned the title, the terrible, by being so vicious and paranoid and cruel to everyone. Yosef Stalin 
the second greatest mass murderer in human history, who killed between 30 and 60 million Russians, not during the war, but through his policies and his purges and his gulags and his secret police, is still respected by most Russians, or at least by a significant minority of Russians, because Man of Steel, that's what Stalin means. His real name was Jugashvili. But Man of Steel, Stalin is strong. And he made Russia strong. In the 90s, when communism fell, the Russians actually had a taste of real democracy. And many Russians absolutely rejected it. They saw it as weak, pusillanimous, dithering, and very un-Russian. The Russians think of themselves as manly men. And uh, the women have no problem with this. So Russia reverts to a dictatorship under Vladimir Putin, which is still going on. And Putin is more popular than the Democrat uh, system of the 90s because at least he is strong. He stands up to world. He makes Russia feared. This all comes from the Mongols. Not because of their blood, but because of their culture. They were barbarians who didn't like civilization. And they didn't mess around. If they were in charge and you didn't do exactly what they wanted, they would kill you. And they were good at it. So the Mongols are going to have a long-lasting influence on European society, on Western civilization, because of their influence on Russia. Another terror comes from the East in the mid-1300s, the Black Death, the bubonic plague. A virus carried on fleas, which are carried on rats, it spreads from the area north of the Black Sea to the Byzantine or Empire, to the Mediterranean coasts of Europe, into Northern and Western Europe, and it kills between one-third and one-half of all Europeans, between one third and one half of all Europeans. Even in Poland, World War II doesn't kill more than five or six or seven percent of the population. Maybe a little more. I have a I have figures somewhere. And if I wasn't subservient to YouTube's copyright laws, I'd be showing you. I may still show you some of those figures. Can I see somebody's notepad? Oh, I have my own. I may have those figures for you in your notepad. I had wanted to. I had intended to. Let's see if I put them in here. When you're talking uh, a disease that kills between a third and a half of all the people in a society, you're dealing with a disease that kills more than any war. Ah, here we are. On the first page of maps, on the first page of maps, see YouTube, it's not a copyright problem. On the first page of maps, you will see two tables on the right-hand side. It'll say uh, Europe subdivided into regions, and you'll see a chart below that that um, shows the overall population of Europe as estimated by these demographers. That's people who study population. And you'll see it goes from about 400 B.C. up through the 1975 period when the book was published. And let's look at the overall trend. You see a slow upward trend during the time of the Roman Empire, and then a crash during the time of the Dark Ages. And then a slow upward twen twen twend again, trend again uh, as the High Middle Ages develops. But then... Look between 1300 and 1400 A.D., and you will see the biggest trough in the entire chart in all regions. That's the Black Death. Kills between a third and half of all Europeans. Much worse than any war. What would that mean? Can you imagine it? Because it's not even. Entire counties are depopulated to the extent where maybe in an entire county you get five or six survivors. The Black Death is a calamity on a scale unimaginable. 
and it drives European society to the breaking point. They have pogroms against Jews because they believe the Jews poisoned the wells. They believe that the mists carry the disease. They believe that the disease is a curse from God for a sinful population akin to the Noachian flood. You have people becoming flagellantes or flagellants, mea culpa, mea culpa, because um, they're trying to atone for their sins and punish themselves for their sins. In an almost Oedipus ripping out his own eyes way, if you're familiar with the Sophoclean play, in order to appease an angry god, the art of the time becomes suffused with death, and the figure of death as the grim reaper becomes ubiquitous. You, you see him everywhere. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down which I don't know if they still say, but they said when I was a kid. It's from the Black Death. The rosy is the bubo, the 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 pus-filled blister that you get. Pocket full of posies are what people did. They they would do anything to hide the smell of dead human being. Ashes, ashes come from the burning of the dead in mass trenches. We all fall down as, in the end, everybody dies. So a lot of powerful but very distressing art is made as a result of the Black Death. And the Black Death sweeps through again and again and again for 100, 150 years, just killing. Some communities post crossbowmen on the roads, and anyone who even tries to get near them gets warned off or shot. They don't want any outside contact. They completely isolate themselves. And it can work until somebody sneaks in. And somebody almost always does. So in addition to the climate, which makes growing food harder, the Black Death costs many, many lives. And it changes European society. Before I go on, I will talk to you about how the climate changes things, though. We're still in the agricultural phase of our technological development. That goes from about 10,000 years before Christ up through uh, about late 17, early 1800s in Britain, and later in other parts of the world, when we enter the Industrial Age. And throughout most of this time, we are just above subsistence, so that 70 to 95% of the population can feed the other 30 to 5% of the population in towns and cities and in other jobs. But it's right near the edge. In fact, it is typical in Europe to have two starving times a year. There's the little starving time that happens in late winter before the winter wheat can be harvested harvested. You have maybe a week or two where nobody, including the lords, including the priests, has food because the winter food has all run out. So everyone expects that. In the springtime, you're going to have a week, maybe two, of little to no food. The worst starving time is in August, July and August, before the harvest. Because, again, you run out of your winter wheat and your supplies and it's before harvest. There's nothing in the fields that's ready to eat yet. So everyone develops what looks like a fat belly. And you can see these bellies in stories today of famine. These little babies, uh, little small children, they have little stick figures except for a giant bulbous belly. And it looks like they're fat. They're not fat. Our digestive system requires solid food passing through it in order to eliminate gas. As unpleasant as eliminating gas is, it's a necessary part. But with no food coming through the digestive tract, the gas builds and bloats and builds and bloats. It's painful. Imagine having so much gas, much gas that you look like a pregnant woman. But it's just gas. It's solid like a drum. That happens to Europe, and you can see it in the drawings of people in the summertime working in the fields. You've got these thin, thin European peasants with these bulbous bellies, and it's because of this experience. When people run out of food, 
they will strip their communities dry bare of anything that they could eat, including shoe leather and grass they try. It doesn't work. They go into the hills and the forests, and they strip the land dry because people are like locusts. When desperate, we will find everything. And so that destabilizes the ecology and the food chain in the hills and forests so that prey animals begin to starve, so that predators begin to starve. This is the origin of many of the werewolf myths in societies around the world. Because in hunger times, after humans have destabilized the food chains in the wilderness, the wolves come in. They can smell death. They can smell sickness. They can smell weakness. And there are stories of peasants basically completely enervated without any energy in their huts, shivering as wolves come between the houses and howl. And then Uncle Ed, who's closest to the door, something grabs him by the ankle and drags him out. And at first people are beating there, they're, they're, they throw things and they yell and maybe the thing drops Uncle Ed, but he's still got a damaged ankle. But eventually the people run out of energy and Uncle Ed finally gets taken and then Aunt Rosie and then maybe others. The wolves come in, they have no fear of these weak, weak humans because the wolves are starving too. That's how bad famine got. And it happened occasionally. The wolves coming in did not happen every year, but they happened when you had a bad crop. And at the beginning of the Little Ice Age, there were a couple of times where different regions experienced what was known as the year without a summer, where they had snow in June, where the crops simply were blighted or didn't grow, where there was too much rain or too little rain or too much cold. And then the wolves came. Then people starved. So all of these things make for a very grim time. And at the same time, you had anti-popes and anti-Christs and Albigensian crusades, and it's tough. And it's from that point that we'll take tomorrow's lecture. Thank you for your attention, and you may talk quietly among yourselves. Bear in mind, on Monday, you have chapter 16 due, I think. Yeah. That means you're going to have a quiz on chapter 16, but also the likelihood is that I will finish this pre-Renaissance review tomorrow. If I do, you probably will have Monday or Tuesday, or both, another quiz on my entire lecture from the beginning of ancient societies up through the late Middle Ages. So you should be ready for that. It's a fairly straightforward thing. Don't stress too much about it. If you've been following the stories, if you've been paying attention, even those of you at home, you should do fine. Uh, just come in remembering a lot of what we talked about. You can talk quietly. Thank you. The stream and the video are ended.